And if you're looking at us right now, we're at the platinum platform. And yes, we are on live. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming to the Humanity Summit, the fifth installment, 2023. What a way to end the year. Um, and this is um, a very special event. Um, thank you to the National Library Board of Singapore for supporting and sponsoring the event, the venue for 26th of November, 2023, and also 2nd of December, 2023. We have luminaries amongst us, experts in their fields. We are all in a global collaboration to give back to the world. A lot of people ask why so, because it is an end in itself, and none of us are doing this for money, and none of us are doing it for any other reason other than you, the live audience, listening to our stories and having some takeaways that perhaps we can add value to you and give you some, um, uh, you know, light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I have with me, uh, Miss Annette uh, Wittenberger, all the way from Texas. Uh, and myself broadcasting to you live from Singapore. And with us today, 12 um, keynote speakers, experts in their fields. We've got Ralph Ave, we've got Annette, um, Professor Ko, we've got Shahadat from Bangladesh, Dr. Su, uh, Vince Michael, um, and also uh, Richard Lowe from the UK, um, Preet. Um, from California, our, our very important person, because she's the artist of the spirituality, so important person there. And we've got Dr. Professor Dr. Asok Banwal, all the way from India. And he's a very special person. We'll talk about him because Dr. Um, Asok Banwal is the president of the Orthopedic um, Association in India, and he does a lot of humanitarian work for India. And we've got Colette, teacher, and also a leader in a field. And also um, Isaac, all the way from US, conferred professor for her field in physics and mathematics um, in his field. So without further ado, um, let us have uh, Annette, and then we'll have a little banter with the rest of the audience. Um, Annette, over to you in Texas. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. It's such an honor to be amongst all of you. Uh, I just have to say, wow, thank you, Vicky, for you working on this tirelessly for years. And you, your heart is just, it's just beaming. And, and I just appreciate everything. Um, so I guess I need to talk about myself. I don't like usually talking about myself. I usually love hearing from other people. But um, she did mention <laughs> that we need to say a little, a few words. So I, I am an, an army vet. I retired in 2016. Um, from there, I became a, a huge mental health advocate. <clears throat> Excuse me. I do uh, live with PTSD, depression, and anxiety, but that uh, I didn't want to let that uh, diagnosis hinder me from doing what I love and that speaking about it. I did write a book. It's the wall between two lives. It's it was written to provide hope for other people who are suffering in silence and I, I create safe spaces I create platforms to use our voice to elevate it so that we can be heard and to uh, let the guy upstairs in um, up at the VA for us and, and Congress know that uh, we need to do more for our veterans, we need to bridge that gap between our civilian community, military community, law enforcement, first responders, all those communities that see a trauma on a daily basis and live with that trauma. Um, you know, how can we be heard and what uh, other resources besides taking medication can we use to, to help to save us, to save lives? So that's what I do. And I'm just, you know, very blessed to continue to be in this space with with Miss Vicky and 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 Ralph and and to see everybody's accomplishments and and see their heart and doing what sets their soul on fire and their passion. So enough about me. Let's continue on. I want to hear. I want the world to to hear about all of you. 
Uh, I wanted, I don't want to go off the screen because it's all different from, from the lineup here. So I'm going to go off the wonderful graphic that Vicky made. I'm going to start with Preet, if we're going off, off script here. Preet, could you please tell us where you are, tell us what you do, and why you do it? Ah, uh, well, namaste, everybody. Um, I just want to get in touch with the light inside of you from me, from me to the entire world that's listening to this. Um, Vicky, lovely Vicky, she introduced me as the artist of spirituality. I definitely feel that. She knows me so well, so fast. So a lot of what I do is feeling the divine. I feel like when I'm painting, I can get into myself and I can teach others how to do that. And I can allow other people to look inside of what I see. Um, and I do that because I want to end any kind of problems that we face in a very beautiful way. Every way is, you know, right or wrong. Um, so I'm not going to say that my way is right, but I try to express our problems with love and kindness. Um, yeah, um, mm -hmm. that's what I do. Um, I was born in India and, um, I did the whole Bombay to Brooklyn and back to Cali. Um, there was a documentary made on me that uh, talks about that and you can find it on YouTube. Um, yeah, so I uh, here I am in California. I'm in my studio, it's freezing, it's in San Diego. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this moment. Um, Thank you. I can actually, yeah, I can show you a few works. I have a few sitting here. This is, let's see if it's going to come clear, though. I don't know why. I might have some kind of filter on. Ah, well, you know what? That means that you have to go to my website. <laughs> and it's Preet Works, P-R-E-E-T-W-O-R-K-S. I don't know. There's a filter that wants to make everything blurry and cool. Um, I um, I think I I think I have said everything I want to say. Just that it's my responsibility as an artist to say what isn't being said, to bring oneness and kindness. Uh amongst us all and it's your responsibility to support artists and to react to art and to look and listen and feel you know um so that certain things that are happening today are not going to happen and i'll just leave it with that right thank you so much Bri. um i'd like to also um bring us back um to thank the National Library, those who are tuning in, you are watching um, the Humanity Summit 2023 fifth installment, and you have with us uh, 12 wonderful keynote speakers, experts in their field. So those of you who are looking, I'm looking at the Facebook right now, there are people coming onto the Platinum platform. Please share to everyone, to your friends, because these stories, will help someone down there. And I'd like to take over um, uh, here, um, the floor, quickly. Um, myself, as an author, um, Candle in the Wind. And amongst us, there's, there are many authors. Um, this book, I'd like to talk a little bit about the book. Um, this event is also sponsored by the National Library Board in Singapore, and is actually on a national level. So you can actually go to Eventbrite to sign up 
for today's event and also for the event for 2nd of December. So Candle in the Wind is available at the National Library Reserve section. So if you go up there to the catalog, you can actually find Candle in the Wind. Um, for the for the speakers um, out there, um, and also for the audience and listeners, I would like to talk about my book, Candle in the Wind. Now this book, it's available um, on Amazon. The Candle in the Wind is written over a five-year period. I'd like to also say that um, this book is something that has launched a new direction in my life to help people with much more sympathy, compassion, and understanding, and sensitivity. And at the end of uh, me reading uh, two excerpts from my poetry, um, I will share with you um, three takeaways for people who are witnessing someone who's going through grief or yourself going through grief. So look for this book on Amazon.com, Candle in the Wind by Vicky Esther Chang. I'm just going to bring up an excerpt. Um, it's written over a five-year period after my mom's passing in 2015. It took me almost five years of grief to be able to her. So this book is written in poetry and prose and lyrics, and I can't even read the book Um without having a lot of pain in my heart. So today's event is also sharing all your crossing over and I'm trying to cross over from uh, grief from one end to the other side. Um, you've got some audience coming in right now. Um, candle in the wind. Number one, um, I'm going to talk about um, the difficulty I face um, when I wasn't even in Singapore, um, the times when my mother um, was going through her hardest physical period of her life. So a background story um, as a poet um, is written in, with tribute to my mother. And all of this poetry is written about my mother when I had a conversation or communication with her in my dreams over this period of grief. And with her um, in my dream. The first story, the first poetry. Um, now this is written about um, Google. Okay, this is written um, when I had to uh, struggle um, thinking about those days when she was physically here in Singapore, when I was in a different country, because I couldn't come back to Singapore um, to see her through the rest of uh, uh, her life. And this is called The Window. The Window. It is as though she will still walk out she will still lift those blue curtains like she always did and peer through the window, looking out, wishing that she's still able to get out. The window, those blue curtains still in the Google map. So she would have still been behind those Google, those blue, wind, blue window in the Google map. The window. Many times I search through the map, still hoping to find perhaps a face, a hand, or hair behind those curtains in the Google map. The window. Many nights I drove and looked up, hoping to get a peek. Perhaps she's still there. Perhaps she'll walk out to wave, to say, to whisper. Those blue curtains are still in the Google map. So I shan't read further because it's a very long poetry that spans over three pages. I'm gonna read another excerpt from another poetry. 
that I wrote um, that spans over five pages. And this book, um, like to tell the audience, it's really restricted to adults because it talks about me meeting her body and changing her clothes after she died in the hospital and bringing her to the mortuary, the long walk to the mortuary. So this is about crossing over um, myself, looking at her um, in her final breath, taking her final breath, and then no more. So this is as real as it gets. So I'm going to read an excerpt um, talking about the pain that goes through my mind um, as I wake up. And a lot of it is written real time. No editing, no grammatical edits. It's written when the poetry and the prose are formed in my brain. And then when I wake up, I write them. This is five page poetry. It's hard. Okay. I search for her. I didn't see. I go again. Why isn't she there? I thought she'd come back. I thought she's here, but she's not. She can't be gone. She's always been here. In this street, walking, buying, talking to her friends, to the strangers she made friends. I search for her smile. I strain to listen for her voice. I turn every corner, every street, going round again. I feel unreal. It's like a movie. So I took off my specs to remove the one final barrier between myself and the real world. Hoping maybe it's a dream. It's unreal. But I took off my specs. The real world is just in front. Is it real? Is it not? It just became surreal. And I searched for her in the corners of my mind. It got darker. I searched for the images. She was weak. I begged her to eat. I carried her out of bed. I carried her onto the chair. I said, I love her. I sang to her. I put on her shoes. I covered her in a towel. I begged her to sleep in the middle of the night. I prayed and begged for God to give us strength, for God to give her time. I searched for her, for her life, where she lived, where she was, where she ate. Now I continue to search, but I know I must stop, for I know she's in heaven, where we'll meet again one day. But now I have to live again, to go on to be strong in my time, hoping I won't forget her and her life and all that's cheap and hoping she won't forget me. So this is really tough, ladies and gentlemen. I, I just have to like, um, this is written over a five-year period, it's as real as it gets. It is an apt as the title, Crossing Over the Chasm. That's why I think it's so important for all of us to share whatever circumstances you are. Um, it's over grief, it's over depression, it's over mental struggle, it's over losing a job. Um, you have to cross over something somewhere. And that's why it is so important for all of us experts in our areas to share our stories because we look good outside. Right, I'm just going to tell you, I heard a story that my friend's um, friend's son has jun just jumped down the building and ended the life. That's one week ago. It's as real as it gets in these very, very turbulent times, ladies and gentlemen, and viewers out there. Um, today, I'm going to talk about grief, but a lot of times, I think you're going to talk about crossing over, migration, integration, depression, um, struggling for acceptance, for example. So uh, my story, Grief, Candle in the Wind, Dreams of a Daughter as 
real as it gets. And a few takeaways for those of you, ladies and gentlemen, who is crossing over from one end to the other. If you are witnessing someone who is grieving, a few takeaways. Number one, do not be curious. Don't try to find out and be curious to look at the room, look at the news. If you are a sensitive person, do not be curious. Number two, do not ask. How is she? How did she die? What happened? What did you go through? Are you okay? Do not ask. You've got to be sensitive. Some people do not even want you to talk about it because there is a mechanism that we all learn and there's a body reaction. For me to share, there is a total shutdown because there is no emotion. And I'm just a high performer in the day. I look totally fine. I could go on my meetings, I could go on everything, and I did not shed a tear, but it's just tearing inside, okay? Do not ask, do not speak. Number three, give it time. Give your friend time, be patient, do not ask, do not try to look at the room, but just tell them I'm here if you need anything. Because every person going through grief is different and their coping mechanism is different. So I do not um, uh, uh, wish someone coming to tell, ask me, hey, how's your mom? Did she have ALS? Did you find a doctor? Why? What happened? Why you were away? How did she struggle? Don't even ask that. So for those people who are witnessing someone who is um, going through grief, just shut up. Take away. And for someone who's going through grief, let me share with you. You have to be patient with yourself and cope the way that you need to. Cry if you want to. Shout at someone if you need to. Smash something if you need to. Run away from home if you need to. Because you are number one if you're going through grief. Okay? If you need to shut people out, shut them out. Because you have to find your own mechanism. And then one final thing, you have to divert attention to something that you need to do to divert. And for me, it was about writing and painting. That's my spirituality. And therefore, um, candle in the wind, uh, my five minutes is up or probably a, beyond that. It's really about crossing over grief. And I hope that my sharing for the audience there and for the um, speakers here, um, it is as real as it gets. Um, and I hope that uh, our story will give to someone who needs it. Um, and my final takeaway is that Love yourself because when you go through grief, you must have self-love and that's number one. Thank you so much, um, Annette. Um, uh, back to you. Annette, I think the person next one is um, on our list. Um, Annette, I think that's Dr. Banwal. Um, Annette, over to you. Yes, thank you so much, Vicky. That is That was very powerful. Uh, you are so right about grief. And, and I think one of the, the other important things is that grief has no timeline. So many people expect you to get over the situation by a certain time. Oh, it's been a year, you should be okay. Or it's been five years, you should be okay. It's grieving takes time and we are allowed to take as long as we want. So I appreciate you sharing about your book. First of all, because I know I remember when you talked about that, how difficult it was for you to write it and how powerful it is and for people to know about it. So I appreciate that. Oh my goodness. Um, yes, so Professor Barnwall, could you please, please introduce yourself, tell us where you're from and tell us what you do. We have here that you're gonna discuss a little bit about Christ management, crisis management and your humanitarian work. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Vaiki and dear friends, I am Dr. Ashok Kumar Bandwal, heading 
Department of Orthopedics as a professor in MGM Medical College, Jamsedpur, India. I feel proud to present before you crisis management and embracing humanitarianism. It is not easy to complete your words over such a sensitive and comprehensive issue in five minutes. I shall put forth and explain a little bit of this with a true life story, how you can manage your crisis. Thank you very much. I'm curious as to what got you into the work that you're doing now and how long you've been doing it for. I, can I share your screen? Yes. Dr. Banwal, we aren't able to share oh. the screen. Um, why don't you explain um, a, a little bit about Dr. Banwal. Um, he is very important here amongst us. Uh, let me introduce Dr. Banwal's work. Um, uh, recently, he just did a total hip replacement for uh, a patient in, in India successfully. And of course, uh, being the president of the Orthopedic Association in India, um, Dr. Banwal um, uh, is an expert in his field. Uh, but I want to say uh, about Dr. Banwal is that he did it for free with his team. So that is exceptional. And what Dr. Banwal did is not only having a free hip replacement, he did it for free for the patient. Dr. Banwal, would you like to share about how your team prepared um, and also how did it go for this total hip replacement and why did you do it for free? Actually, uh, this is uh, not if uh, actually uh, in India has got uh, one of the largest healthcare scheme, Aishman Yojana, and uh, this scheme gives a coverage of uh, five lakhs per family per year uh, for free service for downtrodden patients of the India. It covers around bottom 40% of the population of the India. People do not need to pay any anything. And uh, 24,000 hospitals are impaneled in this scheme in India. So we give this service in, uh, I am working in a government hospital. We give this service to the poor patient uh, and all those implants and all those uh, necessary equipments are being supplied by the government of India, all for free to the patient, needy patient. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Banwal, for his humanitarian work. I mean, you need experts who take time. You need a lot of finances to be doing something like that. Um, thank you, Dr. Banwal. Um, Dr. Banwal, is there any other humanitarian work you would like to explain to us that you are actually over uh, also undertaking? Actually, there are many. Uh, uh, pardon, pardon, please. Please repeat your question. Dr. Banwal, is there any other humanitarian work that you are also doing in India? Uh, we are arranging many blood donation camps. We have helped in um, many more COVID resuscitation camps also and uh, many schemes of the government uh, where we can train many more paramedicals. Uh, you know it was not easy to vaccinate uh, 1.4 billion population you need to cover. So we gave training to many more paramedical personnel who, who can execute and help our work to get rid of this uh, pandemic. Thank you so much. Do, uh, back to you, uh, Annette. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Barnwell. That's incredible work. I can't even imagine. It's, it sounds amazing. Um, our next person here is Avince 
Vince, could you please talk about where, where you're from and uh, overcoming trauma, I believe, is what you were going to discuss today. Yeah, thanks. I'm delighted to be here. I just want to acknowledge, Vicki, your story. I have never heard uh, the story about your mother's passing in that way and the vulnerability that you share and display uh, really moved my heart. I relate deeply and uh, just thank you for showing that other side of you. I've only known you to be the powerful, high achieving woman uh, that pulled all of this together, as well as the uh, wonderful international best selling book that I got to be part of with all you great people here, the Golden Nuggets for Entrepreneurs. So thank you for that. Um, uh, to introduce myself, my name is Vince Michael Belito. I'm a trauma informed coach uh, specializing in empowering people with radical self love, communication skills to repair and enrich uh, their relationships, and the ability to break free from uh, the stubborn subconscious blocks that we have in mind, emotion and our habits so that people can get effortlessly and effectively uh, closer to their authentic goals and dreams and ultimately achieve them. Uh, well beyond that, though, my real goal is to lead other people, um, including myself, further into the direct experience of what I call true self-realization, which is always present right here, right now, deep within our core. My mission and uh, my purpose in this was really catalyzed in 1999, after nearly dying from a drug overdose, I was living a life of crime and violence. My dream was basically to be like a mafia kingpin. That's all I knew at that time. Uh, I learned quickly that I was on the wrong path. After that overdose, I realized I wasn't going to survive unless I made a serious radical change. And I determined to do precisely that. Uh, for the next six months or year or so, I began researching in the library different means and methods to you know, find out answers to big questions like, why am I here? What is my purpose? What is the meaning of life? Is God real? Um, and if so, I need to see and experience that for myself. And then in the year 2000, uh, I had a moment of profound self-realization. I fell to my knees. I was filled with light. My nervous system was inverted in a sense. Instead of being so outwardly aware, I was suddenly inwardly hyper aware. And, uh, I exclaimed the, the name Jesus Christ, and it wasn't just like an expression of astonishment. It was a recognition of Jesus as the living center of all creation and as the very center of my own being. And that was shocking to me because I was anti-Christian up until that moment. Uh, I didn't know anything really about the Bible or Christianity very much. And I became very interested after that uh, in studying more about that. I've also pursued uh, an understanding of many religions. And also I got hungry to bring healing to people, uh, the healing that I was beginning to discover that I needed myself. As I sobered up, I began, and I began practice of Zen Buddhist meditation, I began to discover the real reason why I ended up in a life of crime, violence, and drugs. And I started to have flashbacks of memories of my stepfather uh, violently abusing my mother from the age of 10 forward. And the impact that that had inside of my brain, uh, my nervous system within my body as well. And I began to process those emotions. I began to process the fear, the anger, the rage, the, you know, the, the freeze that took over uh, my life. Many of those nights that I was, you know, in that home, um, having to deal with that um, severe um, terror really. And, you know, I, I just, I decided that I really needed help to go deeper. And I also wanted to be able to help others. And I really just prayed and, and I asked God to direct me uh, in any possible way to making a difference for humanity. Um, and I promised to dedicate my life to doing so if I could totally turn my life around. And I began the path of really deep healing uh, from there. People began to show up in my life and I started to work with them intimately and closely. And I got very fascinated about their, their inner world as well as my own even more. And that's where I really discovered this trauma-informed coaching domain, which is really understanding that the past painful and overwhelming events that we go through do have a serious impact on how we perceive ourselves, others, and the world. And none of our actions are unhooked from perception. In fact, every action we take is 100% correlative to some kind of perception that we have within. And so now I spend a lot of time working with people to help them gently, um, compassionately, lovingly navigate their inner world uh, of mind, emotions, and their body, particularly and, um, and very intentionally, the feelings and sensations within the body. Most of us 
uh, tend to be very cognitive, very intellectual, and try to solve our problems at the level of language and, and intellectual thinking and cognitive uh, functioning. But the reality is that our painful moments, our painful events, like Vicky, you were mentioning, actually record and, and embed at a deeper level. That's the physical body. And unless we actually get in touch with what's going on in the body and bring our own love and compassion to it, we never really get set free. And I found this out in some quite difficult ways. So it's very important to me that I uh, get to work with as many people as possible to help them understand the simple and gentle approach to uh, healing trauma. It doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be uh, painful. It doesn't have to be re-traumatizing. You don't even have to relive or necessarily revisit past painful events, but you do need to make peace with the inner conflict. And it is possible. And that's what I really specialize in is helping people to do that, uh, to feel safe again in their own body, to feel safe within their emotions, uh, to undo the internal conflict, the resistance, the shame, the guilt, um, the unwantedness of what's going on within us. Um, we can actually fall in love with every part of ourself, our lust, our greed, our violence, our rage, our shame, our guilt, all of it is actually worthy of our love. Most of us have learned to uh, deny, to resist, to judge, to make wrong, to find fault with, to ignore, to avoid, um, to pretend that it's not even there, the things that are going on inside of us or the things that we've felt and been through. And, you know, it's a real tragedy because the only way out of the painful things that we've been through is to bring love and compassion to them. Um, and so I learned that because of the things that I've done, I felt a lot of guilt, a lot of shame. I mean, I robbed people at gunpoint. I pushed drugs on teenagers and had them selling drugs for me. And, you know, I'm sure I'm responsible for the deaths of numerous people because of the positioning of the drugs that I was, um, you know, pushing out into the world. And so, you know, that really landed hard for me when I sobered up and it hurt badly. So I had to learn how to love those parts of myself because if not, I wouldn't be here today because I really did almost want to commit suicide as a result of that. But by the grace of God, I was able to bring love and compassion to even that dark side of my soul. And so that's my journey. And that's what I'm here to help other people do. Every part of us is worthy. I was never the gangster criminal. None of us are the facade that we wear on the outside. What we are inside is beautiful, loving, compassionate, invincible, utterly immortal, really. And that's exciting to let people know that and help them see that. So thank you, Vicki. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm glad to share with you all today. That's powerful. Um, Annette? Yeah, I have no words because I, I, I think it's amazing how you were able to find not peace, but purpose, even after everything that you've gone through. Not many people do that. I think I've seen personally that people stop believing in God because they see it as, well, why did this happen to me? Why did these bad things happen? So how do you come back from that? And you just showed that you can. And I just appreciate you so much for being that person to help to teach us and to remind us that you can come back from it because it's it's hard and it sucks. And everything Vicky said in the beginning that I won't repeat now, that is exactly it. It's like you, how do you do that? And, and you're here to show us. So I appreciate I, that God kept you here for a reason, because there is a reason for all of us to be here. And I'm so glad to see that you are one of the reasons why. Thank you so much. Thank you. Colette, you're welcome. Colette, hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> why don't you tell us what you do, where you're from, and let's see, life big changes. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. So excited to be here today. I am Colette Gallagher. I am from San Diego, California, just like Crete over here. We're cold today, cold in San Diego. It's like 50. I don't know about how it is in the rest of the world, but um, yeah, I have a degree in psychology and a passion for guiding others through transforming and healing. Um, I merge my expertise as a teacher, a yoga instructor, and a life coach to support individuals in navigating those life challenges, um, setting and achieving goals, and fostering healthy relationships. So um, yeah, life is always changing. And I've noticed that for some people, it's a real, real struggle. Like it's really hard to navigate um, those changes that are unwanted 
Um, a lot of us are trying to manifest and create, and we're all excited when those things happen. But then the other things happen, sudden deaths. Um, we have a change in health, a car accident, uh, someone that we love dies, uh, job loss, um, economy changes, divorces, breakups. Um, all of a sudden your job is super busy and you have this huge um, task list that just feels so overwhelming. Um, or there's a global pandemic that we've all um, had to uh, deal with uh, the last few years. Um, all of these changes can create so much stress and anxiety and fear and doubt. Um, and then guilt comes up, we're ashamed. Um, all of those um, things trigger us and we feel out of control and alone and, and we start to question everything about our life. And we might even get to this place where we do want to end our life um, and I have been there as well. And so that's something that I'm just really passionate about. I've had so many life changes myself that I'll talk about in a minute. But um, there's how do we navigate? How do we handle these big life changes and come out the other side um, and be stronger for it? So personally, I have faced um, moving and attending eight schools in 12 years as a child, three abusive alcoholic and drug addicted stepfathers. My mom was married four times. I was the, from the first marriage. Um, being sexually abused and removed from my home by Child Protective Services at four years old. Um, going to college in a small town across the country. I moved all the way across the country for college. Didn't know anyone there. Um, job changes, taking care of my elderly grandparents, and um, recently a divorce. So. I have a lot of experience in these big life changes. I have a lot of compassion. My main um, my main mission though is ending the abuse cycle in the world. I feel like when people are abused, they get, it gets perpetuated and um, it gets passed on in different ways and people um, are now learning to heal from it. And so moving so much made it difficult for me personally to make and keep friendships as a child and there's always this feeling of waiting for more bad news to come. There was always something happening in my life and it always felt like I was waiting for this bad news. I was waiting for the other shoe to drop, um, just waiting for things to change and I'm feeling out of control. And um, one of the things that helped me was learning to make the best of everything. I was um, always looking for the bright side of things, um, looking for the good because I always felt that no matter how, how bad I had it, there was someone somewhere that had it worse. And somehow that made me feel better about the situation I was in. So that was one of the ways that I coped. My coping mechanism was to look um, at the bright side of things and find the positive. Um, and I learned how to talk with new people because I was always meeting new people. I learned how to um, be uncomfortable and get out of my comfort zone and talk to new people. Um, and then having the three addicted, drug addicted stepfathers taught me how to spot those people, those liars and um, frauds and um, and to not be so trusting. My mom was so trusting that she just overlooked those things. And so um, growing up, I was often worried about the safety of my mom. And I would go home early from friends' houses and check on her to see if she was okay. Um, she would often ask me to keep secrets for her so people wouldn't find out about the drugs and the abuse going on at home. So uh, when my stepfather told me not to tell anyone about my sexual abuse, I didn't. So that happened at four and I never told anyone until I was 12. And my mom, when I did tell her, she didn't believe me because I think it was just too hard for her to face that reality that something like that would happen to me um, because of her actions and her choices. Um, so that was something really difficult for me growing, like growing up and, and having all of those secrets in my life. Um, and so one good thing about it though is I, I was able to stop when my parents were fighting. I was able to stop them from fighting. So I learned to be really responsible and speak up for people and be that protector. 
um, because of those things that happened to me. Um, and so this is again, why I'm so passionate about ending the abuse cycle in the world so that no other children have to grow up in that kind of household that I grew up in. And so um, I've learned I, with my degree in psychology, I've done lots of healing modalities and um, including Vince's modality, which I'm very grateful for him and his work as well. Um, but um, finding that support is so important. So if you're feeling like you don't know what to do, if there's things going in your life that aren't going the way that you want them to go, just know that you're not alone. There's so many people struggling right now. And um, I remember growing up thinking everyone else had this perfect life, that things were so perfect for everyone else. And I was the only one struggling. And so just know that you're not alone. You're not the only one struggling, no matter how great everyone else's life looks on the outside. Um, find people to talk to, find a coach or a therapist or a psychologist. Don't try to handle everything on your own. Cause I did that for a long time and, and it doesn't work um, as well as I had hoped it would. Um, it was really when I started um, finding support and getting help with with overcoming all of these traumas that my life got better and um and so, yeah so thank you everyone for being here i thought i would like to interject if you don't mind annette you know um Colette has got such a compelling story in 5 minutes um you can't say that and also vince I've got such a compelling life story. There's so much to share. Please go to their website. Go, go to their Facebook and look for them. Um, you know, that's why I think it's so important to listen to children. You know, for what Colette has gone through, she's got her sexual abuse when she was five in the story in the podcast below. If you go, and go back to um, the Platinum platform, she talked about, you know, that she was not believed by her mother. When she was going through that, you know, and she was not able to even um, uh, speak up because she was trained to, um, she was groomed to kind of like keep secrets when she was young. <laughs> Until I think she kind of um, really voiced out when she got much older, you know, imagine you keeping secrets like that for a good part of your life and you were growing up. So that's why I think um, Isaac is so important today. Um, we need to listen to children. Um, they've got a voice and they've got, they've got a hope for the world. They've got a dream for themselves. They've got a dream for the world. We'll talk about Isaac's dream a little bit later on. Back to you, Annette. I agree with their compelling stories. I just, my heart goes out to you, Colette. I, I too was um, sexually abused when I was a child and it took me a long time to talk about that. So um i just i i just you're such an amazing person like you're so strong and for you to be able to turn it into not something positive but be able to talk about it with such empathy and you wanting to help other people is is amazing so i'm grateful for you for doing that i think more people need to reach out to you so to understand how they can continue to live life after going through trauma. So I, I appreciate you sharing. Thank you so much. I that I can't even. I know that was hard. So I appreciate you. Thank you. Of course. Um, next is Suborno. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. Uh, can I start talking? Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, all right. Thank you. So uh, my name is Borno. Uh, I'm 11 years old. I'm the uh, youngest one out of you all. Uh, so today uh, I'm usually a person who focuses on math and physics, but today I wanted to go into uh, just peace and uh, connecting e uh, each other uh, on the outside because I feel like a lot of you have talked about coming to peace within yourself but 
also a lot of times we have to um, make connections with each other. Uh, we have to get over the prejudices uh, and grudges that we hold sometimes. And uh, I've tried addressing a lot of that, uh, especially with one category. Uh, I feel like a very dividing factor for some people and a factor that uh, some people have used in somewhat dangerous ways to uh, motivate very bad things uh, has been uh, has been religion. Uh, although religion has brought us together, religion has uh, given us a reason to be here or religion has given us something to believe in, but religion has also given us some uh, people who have taken ideas to the extreme, some people who uh, can't get over uh, boundaries and who dislike people who believe anything different than them. So, uh, they're really superficial differences at heart because it doesn't quite matter uh, someone's personality, someone's tr uh, traits, how they can connect with you, and the potential of that human being that has nothing to do with uh, what they believe, whether it be religious or not. So uh, no, that's what I've mainly been trying to work towards on the side, even though sometimes I don't have time for it, because usually for me, uh, a lot of the time math and science take priority. So uh, I uh, wrote uh, two books on this subject, uh, but today I think I was specifically asked to cover the first, uh, which is titled The Love. Now, I think I've developed and grown a lot since I finished The Love, which was five or six years ago. Uh, so I don't necessarily agree anymore with all of the things that I wrote back then, but my message still stays the same. We have to connect with each other, no matter the differences in what we believe, because uh, we can still cooperate with each other no matter what. And I'm tired of believing that because uh, someone uh, from one sort of group uh, has done something to you, that you discriminate towards uh, everyone of that specific group. Islamophobia, uh, anti-Semitism, uh, anti anti-Christianity, uh, all these sentiments uh, deserve to, all these sentiments deserve to stop because really it's uh, it's kind of correlating someone's ethnicity to their personality, how they act. Uh, that's essentially just eugenics at its heart. So uh, what I'm saying here is that no matter what, no matter what differences uh, we try to make between each other, no matter how others try to divide us uh, through boundaries like religion, we can still always come together no matter what. And even though there are still uh, global conflict uh, conflicts around the world relating to these kinds of things, uh, one of which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with from reading the news, uh, although there are many global conflicts going on around this, I hope to stop all of these one day uh, because these are, are really becoming unreasonable by this point. Uh, dividing, uh, dividing each other uh, based on this, arguing over uh, some piece of land because uh, your own belief has entitled you to it and believing uh, that your own belief has entitled you to slaughtering members of those who are not your religion or uh, excluding or persecuting members uh, of a different religion or a different anything, a different category, is uh, really just inhumane uh, on a level that I can't describe. So uh, one more thing I wanted to say which is not uh, necessarily related to me, but just about the remarks that Vicky made at the start of the session. I was really touched by uh, her talking about grief because I myself, I know uh, this doesn't have a lot of weight, but sorry, I lost a pet myself uh, last month on October 18th. Mm. I loved her a lot. Uh, she was a very special pet to me. Uh, sorry, tearing up a little bit here. I decided not to really tell anyone about it because 
it's not an experience that I want to share. Uh, I don't, <clears throat> I don't want to get feedback or heat from anyone regarding it. But, uh, but, uh, Vicky from Marks on it really made me feel good enough to open up about it to you all. So thank you. Thank you so much, Annette. Annette, I can't. I can't speak to Annette. Um, uh, sorry. Okay, I was feeling that right now. Um, so <clears throat> I know you've heard this before that you're amazing, and uh, you are you're amazing, and I thank you for for speaking on all those topics because everything that you said i'm sure i've said it in my house not outside of my house for fear of getting into conflict with other people but you're right it needs to be talked about we need to have those discussions and you're just i'm going to say it again you're just you're amazing and i i look at you and i think gosh I, I wonder how my grandson's going to be, and I would love for him to em, emulate you in any shape or form because you're such a smart young man. I'm not even going to call you a kid. You're a smart young man. Sharing about your pet really hit me hard, obviously. <clears throat> Anytime we lose some, some, not someone, <clears throat> A part of our family like that is very difficult and for you to talk about it is shows so much strength and you're right vicky has words that just that hits you right in your heart that make you feel like you have a place to have that kind of conversation so this is a safe space that i know she tried to create and i think it's amazing and special that we are all here and feel like we can so Thank you for what you do. I can't wait to learn more about you. I know Vicky told me about you in the beginning, uh, actually way back, a couple years ago, I think. Yeah, and I, it was I, like two years ago when he was yeah. nine years old. <laughs> yes, but yes, you know, <laughs> but you know, um, Isaac and and Annette and the ladies and gentlemen who are here and in front of the screen, if you're looking at us right now. We are at the Platinum Platform, and this is 2023, the Humanity Summit, the fifth installment, and we're bringing all of this uh, experts in their fields, and we just heard from Sabono um, Isaac Bari, a conferred professor in his field um, from mathematics and um, physics. Um, thank you so much, uh, Isaac, for being here, for pulling you out from your class. I know you're also in class, and he's doing research in the U. Thank you so much. I think she froze, so I will try to continue and go to Professor Ko. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you, Annette. It's nice to meet you guys again. It's been a while. You know, as I listen to all the story, it's just welling up. Yeah, um, you know, just like Isaac, who loves mathematics, I love finance and banking so much. I can talk nonstop about it. <laughs> and then as I was, um, you know, my dreams came true when I became a banker. But unfortunately, um, my mom passed away when she was very young, only 53. And I thought, no, oh no, what am I going to do with all the money I'm earning? So what if I'm a banker? You know, I, my, my brain is so wired. Mathematically, financially, it's all about numbers. I'm probably a left brainer because, you know, the emotion side must have been suppressed for a long time. So to cross the chasm, it was really very tough. 
um, it took a long time. And then I realized one thing. It says it takes a village to raise a child. And I'm that child. I'm the child that needed the love of friends around me, my old friends, you know, my relatives. And it's so difficult, right? Just to open your mouth and and say that, oh, you know, I lost my mom. Instead of buying her a condominium, an apartment, I bought her space, you know, to lie in. But I never gave up. I think financially I'm so equipped. Academically, I'm so trained. I work very hard. Until the second crisis came when my dad had a heart attack. But this time around, I think I matured because I then know that the love that I have from God and the love that my dad has for me, even after my mom passed away, actually propel me all right, to open up. I then look into things like, hey, how about my finance? It's not just about my financial health. What about my physical health? my mental, all right, the, the my fitness, the my health, all right, I, I, I needed a lot of, to build the reserve, the reserve of love. It's just like how I would speak in class to my undergraduates in the National University of uh, Singapore to build the capital reserve on the balance sheet. But where is my mental balance sheet? Where, where is my emotional balance sheet? You know, but like I say, God is so kind to me. My friends around me are so kind to me. The mental support, the emotional really built me up. And it then helped me to reconcile. You know, it was just a realization. I teach the corporates. I train internationally. I look at people from Jakarta, from China, from um, Malaysia, you know, how I teach them and impart and share with them my financial knowledge. I want to take the opportunity, young and old, to share with them my emotional reserves as well. How it is important. And Isaac, I really resonate with you when you say that we need to connect. It's about holding conversation. It's about holding talks like this, leveraging on the connection we have. Never stop at myself, you know, how I share and I begin to understand. And when I learn the art of communication, which is really not me, because I just know how to talk about finance, dollars and cents, mathematics, I, I find that, you know, I have crossed over to another chasm. I've crossed the chasm to another realm to be a more holistic person. And with that love, with their mental health, I, I, I push myself to do marathon. I push myself to be physically fit so that I can be mentally intellectually fit as well and you know today i'm so happy to share with you that it's not just me many of you in this room right would recognize this very beautiful gold nuggets which has gone worldwide internationally all right and on amazon and also in singapore libraries and thanks again you know for singapore national library board for making this occasion possible so that we can share and people around the world can tune in and know that you are not alone thank you so much thanks annette thanks vicky thank you professor ko you're such a beautiful light i'm so excited that we're on this platform again together thank you for your words and for sharing your story as well i know it's difficult but that's where we're here in this safe space to be able to talk about things like that. So thank you so much. Next, I would love to bring on, I'm gonna try this again, Shadat. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, hi, good afternoon. I'm Shadat from Bangladesh. I'm happy to be here today for this uh, wonderful event. Thank, Thank you very much, much especially Ms. Becky. I have been, been working here since year 2000 till now in construction. Can you hear me? 
I came Singapore as a migrant worker, working as a scaffold director. A scaffold is a temporary structure that is erected around a building for worker safety and for other purpose. My key job was erection, dismantling, and alter alteration of a scaffold. It is a very high risk job. Hazards are falling from height, and possible injury is fatal or serious injury. Job safety was my first priority because at the end of day, I have to be back my home safely for myself and for my family because they need me. I did my best to learn every single of tax of my work from my supervisor and I did it safely. I have been working with him a few years after he recommended me to at an SCAFO supervisor course. So by dint of my hard work, I became a SCAFO supervisor. And after that, I became a safety coordinator. And now my current company is Choelbin Private Limited, was recommended one of my friends. In 2009, my journey with Soil Bill started as a scaffold supervisor, which is still ongoing, but company is same. But this long span of time, I only think that change is my position, which is assistant safety officer. So the journey went kind of like this by dint of my hard work. I was promoted to a scaffold supervisor to safety coordinator, which was float by a promotion to senior coordinator in 2015. I had a void in me, like a feeling of not being contempt. I was hungry for knowledge. That is when again a friend of mine suggested that I do a BSc honors safety, health, and environmental management at Lead Beckett's University, conducted by MDIS in Singapore, which I finished with first class honors in 2021. After that, my company promoted me assistant safety officer, which is my current position. Due to short time, I want to share my outdoor exercise, out workouts, about my workouts, running and cycling. Around 2014, while a transing from site worker to office worker. A few years later, I realized that I was getting quite unhealthy and was gaining weight above 85 kg. After that, I started to do exercise, running, cycling, and swimming. And within a one year, I reduced weight from 85 kg to 61 kg. At the very beginning, it was really hard, but I never gave up and got back to my fitness. And I am really enjoying my workouts of cycling and running, and I am still maintaining it. In 2021, I had run 56 kilometers continuously for run for SG56 on a virtual run. After this, I had planned to cycle for SG 57th National Day, year 2022. I cycled around the island for 1,057 kilometers, and it was dedicated to the people of Singapore on the occasions of SG 57th National Day. I posted it on the SGPCN cycling group, and I became a popular cyclist in Singapore. This year, I cycled continuously 1,000 kilometers on Chinese New Year, 2,023 uh, kilometers on the OCBC 500 kilometer virtual ride even, and 2,400 kilometers on the SG 58th National Day all across Singapore. I brought the national flag along with me and I dedicated to the people of Singapore on the occasions of SG 58th National Day, 2023. 
I had a well plant and I studied the route and whether before the commencement of my ride, whatever I did about my workout, cycling or running, swimming, I listened to my body's call once it was required because safety was my first priority. Cycling is my passion. I cycle for good reason and for my good health. Cycling is a low impact exercise, which is great for individuals who are new to working out. Low impact does not mean low intensity. High intensity can be achieved by low impact exercise. Singapore is the safest country for riding and everywhere is connected to a cycling road. So you can cycle and explore your day to maintain your good health. I had ridden all, uh, all across Singapore since last year, March 2022 until now on my Estarba record, 25,000 kilometers. So far, the only problem I have encountered are some street dogs being chased. But as a dog lover, I know how to deal with them. As a cyclist, I have to say, ride more, ride safely, and stay active. I enjoy riding in Singapore. Okay, I have to share something. When I migrate here, I face some problem, but among them, the most significant one, the first hurdle I faced after migrating here was language barrier. Second would be financial freedom, since I was the only breadwinner of my family. And third would be getting accustomed to the cuisines of Singapore. Language barrier, which I overcame by talking to people as much as I could, and also practicing myself before getting accustomed to the language. I had to talk in a pictorial way, like using uh, body language, communicate with my colleagues. For my financial freedom, I would say I couldn't overcome it completely at, the, at that time, since the pay wasn't mass with the, my qualification. So I made a budget which I followed through. And by doing that, I was able to somewhat cope with it. Getting accustomed to the cuisines of Singapore, which was quite easy to overcome since the difference wasn't much. But for a long period of time to cope with it, I cook my own food. I did face some stressful moment when I became a scaffold supervisor. I was mentally stressed because I had big shoes to fill since it was a new experience for me and I had many eyes on me. The other problem I faced was a lack of personal space. We used to stay with 16 people in one room. So it was hard to study and also prepare for the exam. As I said, I always take a positive approach to any situation. So I choose to study under HDB blocks or in a public resting area. There I could concentrate properly and study there. I miss my family and the region. I came to give them a better life. In the business of business of work, I did not even notice when so many years I passed. Ask myself, what did you learn? What did you give up? What did you gain? I had to give up my financial freedom, not being stressed about my life of a struggle, no matter if it is in life or workplace. I learned, I always take a positive approach. I would say the most significant things I learned would be how was welcomed into the community. We as a foreign worker 
have a fear of mixing with the local in general. But I was overwhelmed with how much support the community show me because of my cycling. For my fellow countrymen, I would say the things is for everyone. If you have a goal that you are determined to achieve it, isn't that difficult to integrate. If you don't have love for the work you are doing, even in your country, you won't be able to integrate. For me, I loved my work and was passionate about it. Which is why even being in a foreign country, I integrate quite well. My suggestion to my fellow foreign workers would be to do something they love, not just for the sake of doing it. Let's say I cannot change my world. I cannot change the world, but I can change my world by my discipline lifestyle and proper plan. Thank you very much. I just want to um, <clears throat> highlight Mr. Shahadat, um, a couple of uh, things. Uh, number one, I think it's a role model um, for a lot of uh, uh, migrants. And he, because he came in uh, as a migrant uh, 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 specialist here, uh, you know, he faces a lot of challenges that a lot of people move from one place to another. Again, he was trying to cross over from Bangladesh to Singapore. And he talked about uh, integration and migration, the challenges, and also some of the tips, some of the takeaways. If ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> you are viewing us right now, and if you're migrating from one country to another country, listen to Shahada. Yeah, number one, you need to really try your best to integrate. And for him, uh, he gave back to the local community of Singapore through his uh, sportsmanship, cycling. And that's why hats off to Mr. Shahadat who actually cycled hundreds of thousands of miles just to raise funds for the locals. And that showed his spirit of wanting to give back to the new community that he's now being adopted to. So thank you so much, Shahadat. Um, once again, a good yeah, round of applause for a role model for someone who's migrating to a new country. Um, Annette, before we go to um, Dr. Sue, Annette? No, all, uh, all the points that you just made were, at, were spot on. I, I think um, spot, for me, when I listen to you talk about cycling, um, I loved it. I used to I used to cycle years ago, and now I feel like I need to do it again because you just inspired me to get my bike out of my garage and onto the streets. So I think I might do that. But I think you're incredible for doing what you did. That's that's uh, amazing. Not everybody could do that. So thank you for being who you are. Thank you very much. Yes. Let's see, I would love to bring on Dr. Sue. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone around the world. I am Dr. Sub here and I am representing a very important community in the world that is the scientist community. And you know scientists are how much important to the world because they give back to the society. Uh, first thing fearlessly, second thing tirelessly, and third thing without having anything for themselves. Okay, so uh, just a brief background about myself. I did my major in physics, uh, like Isaac was there a few times back. I love the way he talked about life, being a teacher uh, in maths and science. Okay, I was also a very, I am, I am also a very good math and science enthusiast. Uh, to say I'm a science person, I, I love science. But today I'll be talking about the positivity, uh, what I learned by pursuing science. So, uh, so I, my major was in physics. Then I came to Singapore to pursue my PhD. I had a lot of career options that I, I had in my way, but I had to kick them out to choose the ultimate one, which is pursuing a PhD. 
uh, I got a government job as a scientist in India, which is Bhava Atomic Research Center. It's the biggest atomic research center in India uh, where I could be joined as a scientist, but I, I just kicked that away to uh, pursue more study to being a scientist here. And uh, today I'll be talking about um, like what are the recipes for success uh, when you go through the challenges to become a scientist or in general in life, okay? First, I'll be talking about expectation versus reality. Every time when we go to certain field or every time when we join somewhere as a newcomer, we have certain expectations uh, from around uh, from the people around us, okay, from our bosses, from our leaders, from the CEO of the company or from the company itself, right? But what I learned quickly uh, when I was doing my PhD is that expectation is something where you have to depend on someone else. But uh, the baggage of expectation is very heavy. The more you carry it, the more you will be uh, going into the well where you can't uh, sustain for long. So expectation is something which you keep, but it's not uh, everything that will give you a success. Rather, you go into the reality, do a reality check, be dynamic, okay? Change the career path, pivot yourself, check each and every day what are you doing, whether you are doing it in a right way or a wrong way. Divert from your original plan and find the right or wrong in the path, okay? I always say... Uh, at tough points, you need to follow three S in life. First one is stop. You stop yourself and then find what you are doing. Is it correct or is it wrong? Or do I need to do something else? Then you see. Second S is see. You see the situation, what I need to do correct. Then you start it again. So these are the three S in life, which will give you the fourth S, which is the success. So three S leading to the fourth S. Then Second thing that I want to talk about is the fear of failure. Whenever we go, wherever we go, we always have fear of failure, but we are not so open-minded that we can go and talk to everyone about our, our fear. It's it's not so easy. Personally, I, I will describe myself as an introvert. So I'm not so opened up about the fear that I have. But what you can do is, again, when you face the fear, you need to do Three E's in the life. I already talked about three S. Now you need to do three E's in the life. You challenge the status quo. Okay. The three E's are explore. Don't back away from the fear. Rather you explore. First E is explore. Second E is the expansion. You expand yourself. You expand your knowledge. You expand your uh, like doing whatever you can do. And the third E is excel in life. So two is leading to the third E, which is Excel in the life. Okay, that's how you will get over the fear of failure. Third thing is when I came here, third thing which I faced a uh, problem is the attachment. You always need to leave your attachment behind. Attachment versus detachment. It's a big uh, debatable topic. You cannot attach yourself to certain things so much that you will find it very difficult to walk away you will find it very difficult to work into your career path. So you need to uh, stop. You need to decide whether I need to attach so much or I need to slightly detach and then move ahead in my career path. You need to find what is the goal in your life. Okay. And the final thing is that being judged and judging others. Okay. When I came to Singapore, right, I saw my friends judging others and I also saw friends or Singaporeans judging me. Okay. You need to find a balance between how you will react to being judged or how you will judge others. The mm -hmm. best way is to shut your, um, shut your ear and then move forward. Because when you're being judged, most of the times you get retaliated. If you retaliate, it's bad for yourself because you will think of it over and over again and it will get heavy on your mind. Don't get it to be heavy on your mind because your goal is different. Your goal is not to judge people by being judged. Your goal is to move forward and find a path in front of yourself because every time they say there is always a light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. So those are my, uh, my uh, sweet words 
uh, that you could take expectation versus reality to recap fear of failure attachment versus detachment and being judged these are my four points that i need to give to the community so that they can fight the tough ones thank you annette those I need to write those down again. I should have been taking <laughs> notes, but I was trying to, <laughs> to process it all. But thank you for that. I, I can't those I can't think of anything better. And, and fear of failure definitely resonates with me a lot. So I appreciate you uh digging into that. But um I'll have to come back to you and write those things down and like put it right here in front of my computer. So I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you so much. I I would like to interject, if you don't mind, uh, yes. Ms. Annette. You yes. know, Dr. Su, he is such an incredible person that I have to invite him again and again. He took time off. Um, I like his speech, really, because that's the recipe from his life uh, experience in integrating and migrating to Singapore and taking Singapore as his home right now from India. And I think people could always go back, listen, Go back, listen, because this is a podcast. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Su, for all these ease and the answers that we all, all uh, take notes. Uh, thank you so much from a scientist, right? I should ask him to be my speech writer next time. <laughs> now let's have, um, Annette, I think we have another fine, uh, oh, before, before, we two more speakers before we go into our town hall. Annette. Yes, I want to bring on my other veteran friend here, Ralph. Hi, How's Ralph. Going, <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Good. Yes, yes. Hi. Uh, um, yeah, so I'm I'm a fellow veteran, um, like Annette. And uh Vicky, thank you so much for putting all this together. It's it's always an honor to work with you. And always putting us out there, you know, putting our names out there and helping us out. Um, yeah, so uh, my background is I was a single parent home. Uh, a lot of people know in the U.S., kids that are fatherless usually go to jail, join gangs, and do all that stuff. Luckily, I was uh, raised by a village, like uh, Professor Coase said, you know. Um, my uncles became my dad's. My auntie became my mom's. Uh, my cousin became my brothers and sisters, and uh, my mom always put me in the right place. And after my father passed away, I, I promised her, I said, I'm never doing drugs, I'm never drinking, never smoking. And I believed in that so much at nine years old that when I became a teenager, I was around those guys who, who did it. They were my friends, and I was around them, but they respected me so much in my beliefs that they would never try to make me do those things. And if there was a stranger trying to let me do that, now they'd be up against the wall saying he don't do that stuff. So, um, yeah. So, and then, uh, so just going through my life, just you know, the struggles of a single parent home, trying to find my path, and being doubted in in the Asian community, we're always reserved, we're not outspoken. But um, I decided to challenge myself and join the military at twenty one because I was struggling trying to find a job in uh, Hawaii after I got my electronics degree, which I went to a trade school. And I did 20 years. I struggled uh, through it, but, you know, being reserved. But I did make the 1% uh, rank of the Air Force where it's an E-9. It's called Chief Master Sergeant. It's the top of the enlisted rank. And uh, I just wanted to prove to kids that, like uh, Dr. Sue said, is you're, you're you know, don't get attached to your past. Just keep going, keep moving forward. Um, just keep pushing, you know. But I did struggle when I, I got out of the military because it was such a structure that you miss. I don't know if uh, Annette, if you went through that, but I had a hard time adjusting because of the social structure I had. And then all of a sudden it was gone. And, you know, I had to work a part-time job paying paying me at night to go do interview during the days. And it made me realize uh, there's struggle. This struggle made me realize that, you know, these resumes need to be written the right way because the wording of your 
your resume has to cater to that company or else if, if it's just a generic one, nobody will really look at it, right? You, it's It's got to give that attention to the uh, uh, the job. So I started teaching veterans to do that. And then I started doing that at my job. My, my bosses made me do all that stuff. I was getting paid to do resumes at my job. I'm a technician. I'm, I fix stuff. And they took me to the side and said, hey, well, I'll do the resumes for my guys so I can, they can get into the federal system. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's just, um, did I help? Did I need help going along the way? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, you have to self-reflect. Uh, there's times you have to look in the mirror and just pull your pants up and just keep pushing forward. And then there's times where you, you feel so weak that you, you just go talk to somebody. And um, because of that, now now I do, uh, I coach youth basketball. And that's that's the way I, I continue to find my purpose. Uh, because I, I believe the youth, you know, they are a future and we have to give them that mindset that no matter what your background comes, you know, your, what your background is, keep pushing forward. And at the same time, I say, I'm here for you. You know, I want, I want to be the father figure, not in their like personal life totally, but just some kind of male father figure that, Hey, there's somebody out here that kind of, you know, either going through the same, that went through the same situation or something worse, but I'm here, I'm here to guide you, help you out. And then at the same time, this team is a family on these courts within these lines. Uh, open up to me, take me to the side. You know, I want I want these kids to know that. So the the kids I coach are like 13, 12, 13, 14, 15, up all the way teenagers, male, female, whatever. But uh, I always tell them, yeah, I may be hard on you here, but I always treat you like my own. If I if I see you out there, um, you know, hey, come to me. I'm you know I'm I'm here, not I, not just your coach. And then I always try to train them, make each other better. You know, if you see somebody fooling around in class and that's your teammate, hey, tell him he stopped fooling around. You don't get suspended from one game or you don't get kicked off the team. Or, you know, if you, if you got something uh, like a math problem or and you know it, I tell them, go help them out. You know, make make everybody around you better. That's that's how I coach uh, these kids, because uh, a lot a lot of these kids are, I hate to say it, but they're very entitled now. Um uh, they don't think they have to earn anything. So that's kind of why I do get hard on them to make them realize, hey, everything on this right now, you have to earn everything. And that's for life. You know, you, you think I got that top rank not earning it? No, it wasn't given to me. I, I struggled. People didn't believe me because I was very reserved. And I always like to be in the background and see my guys succeed. I want to be part of that process. I don't want the spotlight. I want them to have the spotlight. And that's the same way I treat my my uh, youth basketball teams. I want them to do the spotlight because they did the work. But, uh, yeah, so right now I would, I would tell people, kids, uh, people my age, uh, you know, fellow veterans, just keep pushing, keep finding your purpose, and don't quit. Uh, find people like-minded like you. So that you have that support system, you know. So that's uh pretty much my story. I know I kind of talk pretty fast, but uh yeah, thanks. Thank thanks you for so much, Ralph. Yeah. We've got uh time to keep. Um we are over the time limit of uh one and a half hours. So the organizers are signaling we've got to be ruthless right now. So we've got to go to Richard. Now, Richard is a very important, uh, Annette. Um, and Annette, you and I, we, we've known Richard over the years, for the past two years. Um, he liked to talk about the third culture. It's so much passion in his mind about third culture and how to integrate and migrate to Singapore. And then we'll go on quickly to the town hall question um, led by Annette and myself. Um, Annette, if you don't mind, I'll introduce um, Richard. Richard, take it away, the third culture. Great. Thank you very much, Vicky. And uh, it's, a, again, a pleasure and honour to be uh, involved with this. Um, humanity and crossing the chasm. Um, at first, I wondered, you know, really what I could speak about. And, um, and I got to know uh, Vicky over the years and sort of shared uh, my story. Um, 
I suppose I look back on my life and I feel blessed that, you know, I was brought up in Oxford, England, uh, came from a very academic family from uh, surrounded by Oxford academia, but um, always had a passion for wanting to travel and um, always looking at maps, always loving the holidays that I'll go on um, with the family is the best time of the year. And when I finished university, um, I'd already backpacked around Europe twice and I saved up enough money to backpack around the world and spent a year backpacking around the world and did so because there was a big wide world out there. I wanted to experience it. I wanted to meet people. I wanted to see the different cultures. And at that relatively young age, it was an opportunity for me to decide, well, where do I want to live? Where do I want to work? Um, and lo and behold, I'm back in Asia and having backpacked around the world and fallen in love with Asia. Uh, I'd spent two years living in Hong Kong and the last 28 years living in Singapore. Um, I'd like to think that I embody um, a universal citizen mindset. And I think this is really the theme that I'd like to share because we're talking about humanity. Singapore is such a cosmopolitan place. We've got uh, many different cultures. The, the main sort of ethnic groups here are Chinese, uh, Malay, uh, Indian. That makes up about three and a half million of the population. But there's another two million that are made up of permanent residents and foreigners, literally from all over the world. And actually, in some ways, the group of people that we have on this um, uh, panel today is a little bit like a mini United Nations, of which in some ways, uh, Singapore is likened to that as well. So, you know, uh, I don't suppose it was um, a major surprise that actually I didn't end up marrying somebody from the UK. I married somebody from Japan. I was very much drawn to Asia, Asian culture. Um, I've, as I said, lived here for 28 years. I have four children. Uh, they've all been born and raised in Singapore. And I refer to them very often as third culture kids. And so when Vicky mentioned about third culture, what I mean really about third culture? Well, if you imagine my children have a Japanese mother, um, a British father, they're born in Singapore, raised in Singapore, have been really adopting probably Singapore values, but also thrown in with a blend of uh, British and, and Japanese. And so they become almost like international citizens. And I would always advocate, I've strong, strongly encouraged my children to, to travel the world because actually what I learned on my travels around the world was probably far more beneficial in terms of life skills than the academic degree that I actually studied. And as I say, I come from a very uh, academic background, albeit I would say I was a bit more of the black sheep of the family when it came to the academics, uh, but that's a whole nother story. So I actually became attracted to multicultural societies. In fact, I find it far more interesting living in a multicultural society where you can learn and listen and hear about the lives and the backgrounds of the people that we have on the panel today compared with, let's say, surrounding myself with friends that come from the same background, have similar beliefs and thoughts, and only really interpret the world through those same values. And so by living in a multicultural society, we get exposed to so many different um, cultures. And through the traveling that I've done and the living in a country like Singapore, it opens up my eyes to see that actually the way that I was brought up, and I was very blessed, I believe, in the way that I was brought up, isn't necessarily the way the rest of the world sees the world. But we see the world through the lenses of which we are brought up in and the significant others that shape our values um, uh, as we go through uh, life. And I must say, I, I take my hat off to people um, sharing their testimonies, some of them going through extreme hardship, but showing that actually when they can come to terms, love themselves, they can turn around a life which can be 
of great value and benefit because they can really get into the shoes and empathize with other people then that have gone through or are going through similar circumstances. So really, I, I take my hat off to those people who've shared some of those stories with us. But something that I'd like to also share and maybe challenge people is that my belief is that we live in an interdependent world and it, in many ways the world has become more interdependent as time has gone by and i'll just give an example my my great grandmother never traveled more than 100 miles uh, sorry actually about 12 miles from where she lived my grandmother never traveled more than 100 miles my parents did travel but um not as extensively as myself and i think you know through that travel um and that the world has become a smaller place where it has become easier to travel, that interracial marriages are far more common, especially in a country like Singapore, that we are living in uh, a more interdependent world. Although I think as politics sometimes um, shapes different governments and that ideology can go through ebbs and flows where the ideology is, well, we should integrate. So as an example, my country, the UK becomes part of the European Union. And then it has a bit of a U-turn, albeit a very close um, uh, uh, referendum, and wants to pull away. And we see similar things happening, ebbs and flows. But overall, you know, I feel that we live in an interdependent world and that there are more things that unite us than actually um, divide us. And even though Globally, um, there are so many ethnic groups with different skin color, different beliefs, religions, uh, food that we eat. There are far, far more things that uh, uh, unite us. And I think really some of the things that we need to be tolerant with is, you know, listening to others, understanding others, empathizing with others so that those the um, things that we see in the world that are different from the way we were raised, again, opens our eyes that it isn't necessarily the only way that the world is seen. And I think if we had a more open mindset like that, we would be far more accepting um, to understanding and listening to people from different backgrounds who we may not like, um, who may say things that we don't like. So in summary, I really like to challenge people to think about well we live on this planet earth and perhaps rather than segregating ourselves into different countries and ethnic groups that actually we're all citizens of one planet in a huge universe and again although we may look speak uh, eat differently based on our cultures we are all citizens of the earth i think that um you know there are certain things that unite us and there are things that uh, divide us. I think one of the challenges of the human race is that we are born with a sinful nature. And one of the things is, you know, how do we overcome this sinful nature? Well, having listened very carefully to the speakers today, I think almost without exception, people have uh, mentioned the word love. And ultimately, when we look at certain universal things that bind us, we all are looking for love. And that if the world was filled with more love, then many of the issues that we um, have in the world wouldn't be a situation that we're facing. You know, uh, to quote and finish off um, my last point, is quoting from the Bible, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, um, speaks about faith, hope, and love, and that the greatest of these is love. And again, for those of you who are not Christian, um, I encourage you to uh, look at the Bible. If you look at this particular uh, chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's all about love um, and how the Bible defines love. I think many people have many different definitions of what love is, and you can ask 10 people what that definition is, and you might get 10 different answers. But ultimately, I think if we're able to love each other, 
um, we would have a better world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Annette, would you like to open the town hall with a question? Yes, so our question for anybody who would like to answer is, if you had the chance to change one thing, what would you change and why? Okay, I would like, we will have to be really ruthless now. Okay. Before I get into it, um, let's welcome the National Library Board and to thank her for sponsoring and supporting this event. Would you like to come on here? Uh, I think, yeah, just to clarify a bit, um, this is a partnership, so we're really glad to like, host these different partners and we welcome Thank these you. forms of partnerships. But I think, um, yeah, it's very sad to say that we don't have enough time, but if you're interested to find out more about the National Library Board, you can just do, <laughs> do a quick Google uh, National Library Board Singapore. We have a ton, tons of amazing resources for mental health, mental wellness, and yeah, even <laughs> Yeah, do feel free to support us. Thank you very much. Thank her so much because we are overrunning the time. I'd like to start at the, the town hall question and then we'll have like three speakers jumping in. Um, One word, the change, I think rise up, rise up. I'd like everyone to rise up from their circumstance, um, be it poverty, be it illiteracy, be it financial struggles, be it displacement, be it a depression, mental struggle, be it relationship struggle, rise up. You will find your way. That's my one hope uh, for the world and one change I hope to see in every one of you, ladies and gentlemen, in front of the screen. I know you're live looking at us now or later on. Just rise up. Um, I'm going to throw the ball to um, Ralph and to also um, Professor Ko. Ralph, one thing you'd like to see change. One thing I'd like to see change, uh, I saw it earlier, I'm gonna copy them, education system. Uh, teach kids more about finances, more than A's and B's. Um, that way they're set up for the future instead of collecting all these $100,000 bills after college. So that's what I would change. Professor Ko. Thank you, Vicky. Um, I have, have in mind, mind don't give up. Just, just press on. on. And tomorrow will be better. Through all the experiences that we have gone through, those are our uh, bullets and our ammunition, our reserve to cling on that. There is always a better tomorrow. Be half full and not half empty. Thank you. Yes, let's have Dr. Sue and then um, Shahada. Uh, Dr. Sue, what is the one change you want to see in the world? I'd like, I'd like to see, to see uh, speak, up. Speak, up. Speak, up speak up for your values, speak, speak up for your fear, fear. and speak, speak up what you have in your mind. Because, because when you speak, speak things will change. change. If you don't speak, the, 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 don't speak, speak things will remain the same and you will suffer in the same way. So speak up in the right way with, with the right values. Right Thanks. Thanks. Shahada? Yeah. As a cyclist, I, I have to say, fitness is very important. So everyone get fit. Everyone. Everyone should be body fit. You can do everything for the you want. So fitness is very really important. Um, evidence is new. I have been working here. 23 years without checking and see. So I'm really, really very fit. And I cycled continuously in this year. Nine days I'm on road, never back to home. I took Mina Press, sometimes passes of East Coast Park. Nine days uh, continuous. Nine days. So nine days I exit. 
Uh, yeah, and, and I think if we keep ourselves healthy, the national health care costs would go down, right? The GDP. <laughs> yeah, let's have uh, Richard and then let's have Annette. What is your final um, word and what is the one change you want to change? Let's have Richard and then Annette. I, I know we're short on time, so I'll keep it short. And One of my favorite quotes from Mahatma Gandhi is to become the change that you want to see in the world. Annette? Mine is healthcare. I think, especially amongst uh, the military community, the healthcare is not very well, and we get prescribed medication rather than really digging into the problem. And so, but it's not just military, it's everywhere. I, I think it's still lacking, and um, we need to fix it. Yeah, and uh, because the final word, uh, from the National Library, because we've cut short a shout out. Please go to the National Library Board. They've got a world of resources. Thank you so much. Go to Google, Facebook, Eventbrite, and all major social media. Go to the National Library Board. You can go to Catalog and then find your book, make a reservation, and then go down to borrow the book. Am I right? Any final word from the partnership. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. I hope this could go on, but we've got to stop. But please come back on the 2nd of December. We will have the same speakers and more speakers to talk about crossing the chasm and helping uh, people like you, some parts of the world. You are going through the same obstacles, encumbrances, and also the chasms. And hopefully our story will touch you. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. And in Singapore, we sign off. And in US, Annette? Thank you, everybody. Oh, yes. And Preet is back. Preet, would you like to say something <laughs> before we go off? 15 oh. seconds to you. Oh, my God. I loved, I, I loved all the speakers so much. I want to know everybody. Um, just you have to understand everybody else. It's going to take a lifetime to understand yourself, but I don't know. I just feel like we have to, we have to help each other more, more and more and more. Yes. 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 And um, Preet, uh, being the spiritual artist, a quote from her, we have to love each other more and more and more. Thank you so much, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Annette hosting all the way from Texas. We love you, everyone. And we love Annette. Preet, Ralph, Dr. Sue, Richard, um, Shuhadat, um, Professor Ko, and all the speakers who were there with us. Again, you are watching the Global um, Humanity Summit, fifth installment, 2023. What a way to wrap up the, the year. And we will come back on the 2nd of December. Bye. Let's give us.